Hi, and welcome back to my videos for Physical Chemistry 1. We spent the last several videos looking at entropy and exploring the way it's related to other thermodynamic properties of a system. For example, we've seen that the entropy of an irreversible process is always a positive number, and the entropy of a reversible process at equilibrium is zero. Today, we'll see that these concepts cause behaviors that we can observe in the real world, and we'll talk about how they apply to chemical reactions. Let's start by remembering that way back in video 21, we saw that for a reversible process, we can express the entropy using this equation. We can use this to determine the entropy change that occurs in one of the simplest possible processes, the mixing of two gases. For example, suppose we have two flasks, one contains 2.50 liters of oxygen gas, and the other is a smaller flask that contains 1.00 liters of hydrogen gas. Both flasks are at 300 Kelvin and 1.00 atmospheres. Now imagine that the two flasks are connected, and a valve between them can be opened so that the gases can mix. What would be the entropy of the mixing process? The change in entropy will be the change in the entropy of the oxygen plus the change in the entropy of the hydrogen. The entropy change for each gas is calculated using this equation. So, for example, to calculate the change in entropy for the oxygen, we need to know the moles of oxygen and the volume the oxygen occupies before and after the valve opens. To find the moles, we'll just use the ideal gas law. We know the pressure is 1.00 atmospheres, and the volume is originally 2.50 liters. R is the gas law constant, and you might remember it has a value of 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres over Kelvin's moles. Finally, the temperature is 300 Kelvin. If we plug all these into the ideal gas law, we find that there are 0 0.10 155 moles of oxygen. In the same way, we can determine the moles of hydrogen too. In this case, the pressure and temperature are the same as they were for the oxygen, 1.00 atmospheres and 300 Kelvin. However, the volume this time is only 1.00 liters. This gives us a result of 0 0.04062 moles of hydrogen. Now that we know that, we can use this equation to find the entropy. We plug in the results we just obtained for the moles. What about the volumes? We need to be a little careful here, because the initial volume for each gas is different. For the oxygen, V1 is 2.50 liters, and for hydrogen, V1 is 1.00 liters. But what about V2? Well, when we open the valve, each gas is able to flow into both flasks. That means that the oxygen is able to occupy the total volume of the two flasks, which is 3.50 liters. That's also true for the hydrogen, so both of the gases will occupy the entire volume of the flasks, so V2 is 3.50 liters for both gases. Notice that this time we won't want to use the same value for R, the gas law constant, that we used earlier. Why not? Well, if we use 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres over Kelvin's moles, the units of liters and atmospheres won't cancel out. For that reason, we'll use the other value we know for R, which is 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole. When we plug all this into the equation, we can calculate the overall entropy, which turns out to be 0 0.70716 joules per Kelvin. Notice that our units for entropy are joules per Kelvin, and that makes sense. Remember, the Gibbs definition of entropy is the heat exchange divided by the temperature. Since heat is a form of energy, it has units of joules, and the temperature has units of Kelvin, so it makes sense that our entropy has units of joules over K. So far, we've been looking at the entropy change that happens during a process that's all at one temperature. However, we can see that the temperature will have a big impact on the entropy. 
How do we calculate the change in entropy that happens when the temperature changes during our process? That's not a simple question, because the heat exchange also changes when the temperature changes. So both sides of the fraction depend on the temperature. So we need a different equation that we can use to calculate the entropy change when the temperature varies. Let's start by thinking a bit more about this equation. Suppose we're conducting an experiment at constant pressure. That's a very common situation in the lab. Since any process that happens in an open container will be at constant pressure, that's the most likely situation that we'll encounter. But that means we can make an important simplification in this equation. You might recall that at constant pressure, the heat exchange is the same as the enthalpy. Also, you might remember that the definition of the constant pressure heat capacity is given by this formula. We can rewrite this formula slightly to solve for dH, which gives us this. Let's plug that value for dH into our entropy equation. This result actually gives us a solution to our problem. We wanted a way to determine how the entropy changes as we change the temperature, and that's exactly what this formula gives us. We have the change in entropy here, and the change in temperature over here. Of course, this equation uses infinitesimally small changes in the temperature and entropy, but we can convert that to macroscopic changes by taking the integral of the right side of the equation. So, this equation tells us how much the entropy of a substance changes as we change the temperature, and that's what we wanted. But wait, there's still actually an important difficulty with this formula. This formula was arrived at using the ideal gas law, which assumes that there aren't any intermolecular forces attracting molecules to each other. Of course, molecules in a real gas do attract each other, and that means that gases can become liquids or solids when we change the temperature, or vice versa. For example, water vapor might become liquid water. Unfortunately, this is a problem for the equation we just derived, because the heat capacity in our integral might be very different for the solid, liquid, and vapor phases of our system. So, for example, if we start at a very low temperature and end at a very high temperature, we can split this integral into three pieces, one for each of the three phases. That means that the first integral, which is for the solid phase, has a lower limit of the initial temperature and an upper limit of the freezing point, where the substance melts. Inside the integral, we have the heat capacity for the solid phase of our compound. Meanwhile, the second integral is for the liquid phase, so the limits are the melting point and the boiling point, which is also called the vaporization temperature. This time, the heat capacity is for the liquid substance. Finally, the third integral is for the vapor phase. It has an upper limit corresponding to our final temperature. Notice that these three integrals assume that we're raising the temperature. If the temperature is actually decreasing, the equation would be exactly the same, but we'd have to reverse the upper and lower limits for each of the three integrals. However, even this equation leaves out something important. Remember, when the phase changes, we're not just changing the temperature, we're also disrupting the intermolecular forces between the molecules. That process has an entropy, and our equation needs to account for that. So, for example, if the temperature is increasing, we'll have to include the entropy for the melting process, and also the entropy for the vaporization. Using the Gibbs definition of entropy, we can see that the entropy of each of those two phase changes is equal to the heat that is gained or lost during the phase change divided by the temperature. Since we said earlier that the system is at constant pressure, that means that the heat change is the same as the enthalpy change. So we have the enthalpy change for the melting process and the enthalpy change for the vaporization, each divided by the temperature at which they occur.
If the temperature were decreasing instead of increasing, then the enthalpies would be for the freezing and condensation processes instead. So far, we've just looked at the entropy of simple changes. For example, the mixing of two gases, or the change in temperature and phase for a simple compound. But what about chemical reactions? In a reaction, we have one or more compounds that are transformed into completely different compounds. How can we determine the entropy change in those cases? Well, let's remember that the entropy is a measure of how disordered a system is. How can you tell whether chemicals have a high or a low entropy? It turns out that there are several ways. The most important way has to do with the phase of the chemicals. For example, in a solid, the molecules have a fairly orderly location. They're locked into a specific crystal shape and don't move around very much. On the other hand, in a liquid, the molecules move a bit faster so they can escape their intermolecular forces enough to move around but still, they stick together enough to be held in the bottom of the container that they're in. Finally, the molecules in a gas are able to move around freely anywhere in the container. In these examples, the solid has a low entropy because the molecules are arranged in a pattern that has a very small amount of disorder. On the other hand, the molecules in a gas can be in any random location in the container, so gases have a much higher entropy than solids or liquids. So, the entropy depends on the phase of the molecules. It also depends on the number of different compounds present. For example, suppose you had two samples of gas. In one, the gas is made up of only one compound, so every molecule in the gas is the same. The other gas is a sample of three different compounds. In that case, the three kinds of molecule are distributed randomly throughout the gas. If you were to reach into the second container and grab one molecule, you might get any of the three possibilities. But in the first container, you'd always get the same kind of molecule. That makes the first gas more orderly. It has a lower entropy than the second sample. A third factor that affects the entropy is the number of molecules there are. The greater the number of molecules, the more possible places the molecules can be located, so the higher the disorder. That means that the entropy is higher when there are more molecules present. For example, consider this chemical reaction. In this case, two ozone molecules react to form three oxygen molecules. We can determine whether the reactants have a higher entropy or the products. We just need to remember the three factors I just mentioned. The most important one is the phase. Remember, gases have a higher entropy than liquids or solids. In this case, the reactants and products are both gases. So we'll move on to the next factor. The second most important factor tells us that the entropy is higher when there are more different compounds. In this reaction, there's just one kind of compound on each side, so that doesn't help us. Finally, the third factor I mentioned is the number of molecules on each side. This time, there's an important difference. There are two ozone molecules on the reactant side and three oxygen molecules on the right, so the products have a higher entropy. We can use those three simple rules to help us figure out whether the entropy goes up or down in lots of different chemical reactions. The same logic also applies when we're comparing similar molecules that have different numbers of atoms. For example, consider the molecules ethane, ethene, and ethyne. Which one would you suppose has the smallest entropy? Well, just as a system has a lower entropy if it contains fewer molecules, Molecules have a lower entropy if they have fewer atoms, so ethyne has the lowest entropy of these three. You could have also told that it has a lower entropy because the carbon atoms in ethane are connected by a single bond, and that means that the methyl groups in that molecule have the ability to rotate. The methyl groups can have many different conformations, which is another reason ethane has a higher entropy than ethene or ethyne. Next, consider these three molecules, iron-3-chloride, uranium-3-chloride, and chromium-3-chloride. 
which of these will have the highest entropy? This time it might seem like there will be no difference because each of them contains the same number of atoms. However, the central atom in each molecule has a different number of electrons. If you check the periodic table, you can see that iron has 26 electrons, uranium has 92, and chromium has 24. That means that uranium contains more particles, so it should have a higher entropy. If we look up the entropy for each compound, we find out that that's exactly true. Uranium chloride has the highest entropy, and chromium chloride has the lowest. Finally, the structure of a molecule can also affect its entropy. Consider these two molecules. These molecules are isomers of each other, so they have exactly the same atoms and therefore the same number of electrons. However, the second molecule has a ring, which prevents the single bonds between the carbons from freely rotating. Since the first molecule has carbon-carbon bonds that can rotate, it can have many different conformations, so it has a higher entropy. So, to sum up, there are several different factors that can affect the entropy of the reactants or products of a reaction. In decreasing order of importance, these are the phases of the compounds, the number of different compounds, the number of molecules, the number of atoms of different types, the number of electrons in the atoms, and the presence of rings in multiple bonds. Well, that's enough new material for now. You'll get plenty of practice determining whether the entropy goes up or down in different chemical reactions based on the rules that we've just mentioned. In the next video, we'll finish up our discussion of how entropy is calculated for some simple chemical reactions. It'll be the end of a fairly long chapter in our book, and when we finish it, you'll have a fairly deep understanding of entropy, which is one of the most abstract concepts that we'll cover this semester. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week!